Before Dead Mouse was nominated for several Grammy Awards, before Dead Mouse's iconic helmet developed a cult following, having his fans tattoo it all over their body, also an extensive merch line, fan art, and collectible figures. Before Dead Mouse rocked world stages and iconic events like Lollapalooza, and it was reported that he earns no less than $100,000 per gig. Before his very active social media presence on Facebook and Twitter would get over 9 million supporters. Before Dead Mouse would date smoke shows like October 2009, Playmate, Lindsay Evans, and tattoo goddess Kat Von D. Joel Zimmerman grew up in Niagara Falls and early on showed an interest in electronics and mechanical things. He spent his youth dismantling machines and putting them back together and became obsessed with video games. But when his parents divorced in his teens, he took to raving as a form of expression. A habit that didn't go over well with his parents. Joel always seemed to be ahead of the curve, advocating for computers and music production long before anyone else had considered it. He was a whiz kid on the computer and would spend his time in chat rooms back when the internet was in its infancy. When a dead mouse caused his computer to crash, that story evolved into his online username. After high school, he moved to Toronto and befriended a fellow programmer and the two made a joke track that jabbed at how formulaic house music was. What they hadn't counted on was it becoming a massive hit. What's going on guys, my name is Michael McCredden, documenting the rise to fame of Dead Mouse, here for you on Before They Are Famous. Now you guys requested this video a long time back, I'm thankful I can finally get it done for you, I've just been really really busy. I hope you guys enjoy this video. Oh yeah and as always, let us know in the comments down below who to document next. Hmm, my shoe just made like a squeaky noise, kinda like a mouse. I mean, the record that Justin Bieber's on that has his name on it that he hired other people to do is fire. What I'm mad about is that none of it's this little dickheads. Joel Thomas Zimmerman was born on January 5th, 1981 in Niagara Falls. He is of German, Swiss, and English descent. His mother Nancy is a talented visual artist, and his father Rod, an auto worker for GM. He has an older sister, Jennifer, and a younger brother, Chris. Three blind mice. See how they run. They probably loved that growing up, right? By the time Joel could walk, he had a love for mechanical things. He liked experiments that had an immediate measurable effect, like putting a fork in an electrical outlet or running a magnet over the TV to distort the image. Yeah, he was quite the handful. His maternal grandmother, Katherine Johnson, helped nurture Joel's interest in gadgets, a clever, resourceful woman who raised seven kids on a budget. She would go to Goodwill and she would scoop up TVs and toasters and bring them to her grandson so he could dismantle and reassemble them. Then one Christmas, Joel received a set of precision tools. Now the kooky kid had all the resources he needed to pick everything apart. His grandmother was also responsible for introducing him to video games. When Joel was five years old, she bought him an Atari system and he was hooked. His mom would leave for work in the morning, she'd come back at night and he'd still be there. Now they did live in Niagara Falls, so it's better than him like hanging out in a barrel and going over the falls. You know what I mean? Now Joel found a new obsession when his mother brought her business computer home one day and he was able to mess around with it. He coded the workings, occasionally deleting his mother's business files in his quest to master DOS. One day he told his mother that he'd communicate with a stranger on the other side of the world. His mom was convinced it was a joke, but no. Joel had worked his way into a bulletin board service and rudimentary web chats. Probably found some other weird stuff on the internet because even back in the day the internet was still weird. When Joel was a teen, two significant things happened. His parents, they divorced and he started going to raves. Decided to dye his hair bright yellow and molded it into a bunch of spikes, kind of like Bart Simpson. He wore some ridiculously baggy pants, a Pokemon backpack, a metal chain and he had a necklace around his neck that was made up of these plastic balls. Well let's just say his father was not impressed. But his mother, being an artist herself, she wanted to nurture her child's creativity and didn't mind as much. Okay, maybe she was a little upset when he came back from the raves, but that was probably due to the drugs. She was okay with the way he looked, that was self-expression in her eyes. It looks like an old um, operator style switchboard thing oh, okay. with a monophonic plug. When Joel was 15, he started making chip tunes, musical compositions made using the chips from old computers. In his later teens, he became involved with a dance music radio show in Niagara Falls called The Party Revolution. It was a low budget affair run by the local dance music record shops, Electrified Records. His job was to be the technical whiz kid. In other words, he was the only one there who knew how to use a computer. 
He honed his composing skills while working there, and while his colleagues were interested in traditional DJ techniques, Joel was learning the latest digital tools and equipment that would allow him sampling, sequencing, and looping. It was a sound that was way ahead of its time, and soon his chip tune started attracting the attention of those out in Los Angeles. In 1999, some of Joel's compositions wound up on Methods of Mayhem, the rap tinged album by Motley Crue, and drummer Tommy Lee, he really liked this young kid. Joel became good friends with Tommy Lee, and soon his passion outgrew the small town he called home. By the way, Niagara Falls is such a blast. I got my first BJ there. True story. After graduating from West Lane Secondary School in Niagara Falls, he made the move to Toronto and at first scrapped together rent money by producing tracks for Play Records, a Toronto house music label, and through programming and web development, well, he had decided to register his own business. What was he gonna call it? He decided to go with Dead Mouse. And for you kids out there who were calling him Dead Mouse 5, get it together. So where did he get the name from? Well, one day Joel was chatting with a friend on his computer when it abruptly shut off. It smelled like burnt wire, and when he started to dismantle his computer, he found inside a dead mouse. Joel then became known as the guy online, Dead Mouse Guy. Uh, I found a mouse, a dead one, in a computer. And then I named myself Dead Mouse on, on an internet chat room. He tried originally to spell it out the way you typically would, but it was too long. So then he decided to swap out the final few letters. Instead, he would go with a number five. In the early 2000s, when he tried to convince local recording studios that they needed to embrace computers, no one was interested. They had an old school approach, and to them, integrating computers with music production was like rocket science. No one knew how to do it. Oh, them Canadians. They're always behind on the times. Truthfully, it's like I couldn't get a job in TV. But Joel, he was persistent. Eventually, he managed to convince a small studio in Toronto to let him install new technology, and he helped record numerous local bands. Having this shit like skull fucked into my head is like, wow, you know what? I wonder how they're making this techno music. Yeah. You know, like. In the mid 2000s, he was offered a job working with the Belgian company behind Fruity Loops. Yeah, you know that audio software that's all the rage. At the same time, he was building the tools to create dance music, and Joel composed his own tracks. He was working with Steve Dutta, another programmer from LA, and the two made a track under the name BSOD, which stands for Blue Screen of Death. It's a computer jargon for Windows, you know that error message? Yeah, they thought it was hilarious. This is the hook. It's catchy. You like it. This is the hook. They took a house beat and added a digitized voice explaining what was happening. It was a jab at how formulaic house music was, and they thought it was hilarious. What they hadn't anticipated was that this track would become number one on the online record store Beatport's chart. They decided to write more BSOD material, hoping to make some extra cash. Now at the time, Dead Mouse, he was only earning a thousand bucks a month, and rent alone, well that cost 800, so money was pretty tight. They made a whole BSOD album and remixed Hurt by Christina Aguilera, but the money ran out and Duda, well he had to return to LA. If I'm not saying Duda's name right, I'm gonna be in a whole lot of shit. One of the first thing Joel wrote after Duda left was Faxing Berlin. He released this under the moniker Dead Mouse. Yeah, he was using that name from his one man web developing business from a few years back. He sent the track to British DJ Chris Lake, who passed it to P. Tong, who played it on his Radio 1 show. The subsequent exposure turned it into one of the biggest records of 2007. The clever fusion of trance chords and house beats spawned a series of imitators and propelled the creation of the dubstep subgenre. Wait for the drop. I'm sorry, the drop? Dead Mouse's first full length album, 2005's Get Scrapped, was smarter than your average dance music album. Every song had jokes inside it, nerdy musical references. One track is called Waking Up from the American Dream, another Board of Canada, and that's a nod to Edinburgh based electronic duo Boards of Canada. The sly humor and intelligent pop culture reference, well, it was a hit. Soon after, tracks such as Not Exactly, Sex Lies, and Audio Tape, and The Reward is Cheese followed, and Dead Mouse was scheduled to perform his first paid gig. But he wanted to do something that everyone would know, well this guy's a little different. Part of Dead Mouse's logo way back in the day had been a grinning mouse with oversized ears. He decided to turn it into a mask. He contacted a firm in Toronto who made props for film, and they agreed to build him something special. The first time he wore it was at a club in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and the audience were stunned and a little confused. I mean, who the hell was this guy? But when the helmet's lights came on and started blinking to the beat, well the place went absolutely nuts. It was a stroke of genius and one that transformed him from a musical outsider to a mainstream icon. He said, dude, if you ever perform live, you have got to wear something like this. He soon developed a legion of loyal fans that proved their loyalty when Deadmau5 was nominated in DJ Magazine's online poll of the world's top DJs. 
So many of his followers rushed to vote for him that the site couldn't handle the traffic and crashed. Yeah, once again, a mouse caused some unexpected technical errors. Regulation 30. <laughs> Yeah. Nice. As for the rest of the story, well, you know the story because this is before they're famous. My name is Michael McCrudden and I do a whole lot of celebrity bios. I haven't done a DJ before, or maybe I have. If I have, let's have one of the editors put it next to my head right now. Uh, but there's something for everyone on this channel. We do rappers, we do singers, we do actors, we do comedians, we do athletes, and of course, we do them porn stars and the YouTubers. Those are my favorite. Anyway, guys, browse around, hit subscribe, and I'll see you guys in another video. Boom!